thank you very much. So, um, it's a great um, opportunity, I think, for us to hear from um, three of the founders of this field in a slightly more, perhaps, candid format than uh, what we have heard so far. Um, so, um, to get us started, um, I know we've heard about their research interests today, but I thought it would be interesting to ask each of them to introduce the neighbor, tell us who they are and what they think is their greatest achievement. Yeah, sure. I will let you start. <laughs> All right. So, this young, young girl, um, I met him when I was doing my master's, and he was coming to do his first time. Yeah. And he came to Montreal as a stopover in Chicago. And, uh, and briefly, it was clear that he had a shared interest. And later, um, he invited me to come to Canada. I learned so many exciting things, including foundation nights. Um, there you go. Still a hot thing today. Jeff was invited to a conference in France a few months later. Uh, <coughs> in 1985, during 1985, he came to the where he did a, a keynote on Muslim <coughs> And uh, he had somehow uh, read my paper written in that French in the, I think I'm right, in English and French. Uh, in, the, in the proceeding, he figured out it was kind of similar to that part, and then he connected with this very important. And so he kind of seeked me out. We had lunch together and we had Christmas and we figured out we were really interested in some questions and I did some philosophy that stuff. And I did some paper that way and then uh, I did some paper in the early 90s and the first summer school in 1986 and then uh, 1987. So this was uh, the one person in the world who he knew most. It was the dream come true in the beginning. It's not much of a dream. I wouldn't be good at some of but I can't actually find it all. Was it? It's okay. There you go. This is what I always do. So it's only a few minutes. Okay. So, um, no. Um, so it's a very nice piece. Um, <laughs> It was a fun and real nice to try to be speaker because he's clearly hopeless. But he, <laughs> he did pretty well despite that. Um, and, yes, uh, so I've known him for a long time. Um, he's the only person I've published with where all of my joint papers are over 4,000 citations. Um, <laughs> so, yes. 
just as I had started somewhere in the country, I mean, somewhere in the country, the place of the cemetery, the first place of the church. So I think it goes to a place that you can consider the future to be research policy events, which is the kind of good people to support. Um, not, to expect, not to expect them to do what they said they did, but to just go on doing what they did. Um, just so is now a stage of this career that I wish I would have had. Um, so things are happening very fast now. There's lots of new ideas, many of them coming out of just this way. Um, I just can't keep up with it. I think we have three or four hundred projects to do. That's what it feels like anyway. So there's a couple of like I think of a week. Um I've been particularly impressed by the work on the country. So um yeah, my feeling was that you know, I was the oldest one, and I was the second one. And this is the third of us. Um, and this has some touching up with him. Unfortunately, I think he's still gone. <laughs> so, particularly with the work on the protected and true foundation, I think yes, that's meant to come in fact, but yeah, maybe a combination of this until we have the first one of these. And so, that's what I'm saying. Um, there's been a few opportunities, I think, to you know, mention work that has been done in the past. Many previously have been really influential even today, and we didn't realize until many years later the influence of these results. And I'm curious to hear from you what's the difference between doing neural network research in 1985 or 1995 versus today? In what ways have actually built the practice of it? Of course, there was interesting parallels between the time when we met each other in the 1980s and 80s. Where the neural nets were still my job compared to the traditional ones, and what happened maybe five, ten years ago when we talked about the neural nets came back. There was also a period in the early days where the neural nets were very hot, and there was a lot of hype and many companies were trying to exploit it. So there's some parallels with now. I guess the huge difference is that it's now really working. Yeah, I think it was, it was working very well. Right? So, I mean, a lot of the little applications were just a lot of the Yeah, I mean, you know, very often you see this in the history of technology, but you have to keep it very AI is so broadly broadly speaking. So, people who were working with the perception and the underlying back in the 60s and early 60s, by the time, you know, by the late 60s, when, when People became convinced that that was not a valuable class for the different economy nations. They started just changing the names of the technique that they were using. They became edited subjects. And, you know, those have huge practical consequences when, uh, you know, back in the old days when people had modems, they would turn on the modem and then it would just, you know, make this horrible noise. That's actually a perception that we have on a pseudo random to do the cooking section. Yeah, that's right. Most of them are. But, you know, modern modern starts to do this for the electric antennas. The fact that, you know, sometimes you get a few bars on your cell phone, uh, and sometimes it disappears, it's because there's an electric antenna that you know, focuses the beam on the cell phone, and it's an electric algorithm that's very similar to how you have to do it. They all have to do it in the same So it changed the name, really. And you see this also in AI, you know, it used to be that the, the crowdfunding algorithm and the GPS, you know, they used to be part of it. They're still in the AI textbooks, but you don't see this as AI anymore. It's just an algorithm. Or, you know, three explorations for, uh, for chess. So the same phenomenon occurred with neural nets in the 90s, where, you know, a bunch of companies kind of were founded around the idea of using neural nets for particular applications, like for security or 
things you control or, or just control it to the river. And these were cars and whatever. And it's so used. And they really went on the ground. They were they weren't like, you know, really sort of noodles. They choose them now. But they were used, you know, the same with the self recognition system. Uh, with some shots. So they, they were used, but not, not really kind of uh, seen as the past to the past to the army. So I think there's two ways of that. So it could be that the kind of way that you tell me what's certainly going to happen is that a lot of techniques that are being used today are going to uh, disseminate widely in the, in the coming and when things come to all different things. And it's probably going to go underground after a while. Uh, unless we find the next step for the next, uh, you know, the next step in progress or uh, that will sort of keep this sort of technique uh, in, the, in, the, in the eyes of everybody. But if you don't fund this, those techniques will just be in the public too much. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, I, I find it much harder also to work on people now than just five, six years ago. Five, six years ago, you could come up with some, you know, type of something, you know, some like, you know, bring your own idea and try it out and it would work and you would, you know, have a hard time producing paper, but, you know, we would think to hard time to and uh, whereas now, everybody is working on it, so it's much harder to actually uh, be innovative. And so that's why we were kind of, you know, some of us sort of shifting our interests to the next step. This is a kind of question that related to this. Um, you all have a large number of papers. Some of them have several thousands of pages. Amongst your set of papers, is there like one gem in there that you feel nobody's reading, but you really feel like this is a seminal contribution, and this crowd will be the first to read it? Let's start, let's start with Jeff. He has a little paper, he has a list of pictures. There is a type. Um, now, the correct strategy here is to figure out your age. Figure out, the, figure out the paper that's one below your age number. And tell everyone to read that one, is it? Right? Yeah. And yeah, then you have to worry so, about age numbers anymore, I think. <laughs> there is a paper that I wrote with in the system in the back of 2008. Um, it's um, using matrices to model relationships. Um, Matrices, matrices, it's like that, it's using matrices also to model concepts. And so you're giving triples, and you have to, in the first two terms of the triple, you make the third term. And we did a lot of work around the year 2000, which I don't know if I can have it, what I call linear relation theory, which was basically early work in learning and development, keeping in connection with how it's going to be. And actually, I have a wonderful review. Um, Peter has been working on this book for the last seven years. It only has one non self citation. It's time to move on. <laughs> that was Peter Player. Fun, one remembers it. I still don't know who wrote um, it. So, anyway, the idea was instead of using vectors for concepts and matrices for relations, which has the problem that if you've got a hundred component vector, you need a ten thousand component matrix. Um, you use matrices for both, and that has a big advantage over relations of the same kinds of things as objects. So you can do relations of relations, and we taught it a tiny problem. So we taught it that sort of three and plus two makes five. So relations plus two makes five, and we sort of both have five. And then we took it, um, two and plus makes plus two. So actually, the output would have to be two. I mean, we've never seen the combination of two and plus two. So we have to create a matrix for plus two. And then we showed that that matrix actually work. So if you gave it seven, this new matrix would make a plus two, it would be the number. And this paper got absolutely slaughtered up to that. I think Tang got a two or two and a three. Um, so I don't think it's a positive science. Um, they, they got completely murdered. I mean, they didn't like it. Except that the 
Edison put in front of John Adams. said, if I've understood the paper right, it's amazing, but I don't think I really should be interested. <laughs> um, and I still think there's a very interesting idea in that of using um, matrices for a set of vectors. So you can put them in the And that's exactly what's happening in vectors. Um, I suggest everybody go read that paper and see if you can get to the in order to learn these kind of abstractions, which is sort of my obsession, we need the guidance from all over here, this human and we might need the same kind of thing that we do. And then the question is, well, where do these other people talk about that information in the first place? So, the answer, of course, is cultural inclusion. That's the process of this business of the world, to teach them how to talk about children and so on. And so the question is, how could we use these kind of ideas to train not just a single learner, but a whole collection of the ideas? Combining some of the ideas that I worked on with an earlier course curriculum training, where one agent teaches another one, and I think some curriculum easy to use the other chapters. So, so I think these kinds of ideas, initially I proposed this actually to uh, Google, the project, uh, to be able to paralyze training in our history because current distributed training is stuck with uh, just a very uh, big problem of having to communicate to lots and lots of ways with lots of different activations to train all of the nodes. But if the only thing you need to communicate is this very small, high level of stuff, Learning together in the trial way, you can highlight as much as in one day every time you see the video. So, I don't know. So, I don't know. Yeah, a couple of little things. So, I guess I'm going to try to do a quick one paper. So, this is one one paper that we actually never read, but it's been around a couple of years. So, we did that two or three times. I started with this primitive spatial composition. It was about spatial point coordination. This was back in the days when we were interested in unsupervised, very lower-wise training, where we were trying to find ways to train a fair layer to something in or some kind to represent, to find slightly higher level representations of the things we were training on. And the problem is, when you train a motor encoder, is that you don't want it to learn the identity function. Because the ones you're interested in function, it is doing it. So you want it to reconstruct stuff you train on, and you, you want it to not reconstruct anything else. And that's the hard part. And so one way we found to do this was to make the middle layer sparse, for example. And the first thing that we have to do is an idea of you know, different ways to do this, you know, using different coders and stuff like that. It's just the concepts that work and using. We came up with different ideas. Also, uh, uh, just at the time, came up with the complex versions, which is what we're going to do in the And uh, this idea of uh, PDT spatial composition is that uh, you, you have an encoder, but the input of the encoder does not become the, the output of the encoder does not become the input of the decoder. But in fact, they are decoupled. And there is a cost function for making the input of the decoder different from the output of the encoder. And there is some sort of, you know, energy-based kind of version of this uh, uh, to make this work. And it's, uh, it connects with some stuff that uh, Yoshua and David worked on for the part, which uh, we first got worked on many years ago, uh, where instead of backpropagating gradients through an RMF, you propagate targets. So I think that's an idea that uh, has legs, but has not been exploited or implemented in the right way, or not been really explained in the right way, or you know, we haven't found in situations where it actually works, like that for a long time. You know, it's, it's obviously a good idea, but we haven't really found anything that makes it clear. So that's one idea. There's a, another idea. Maybe you didn't get an application, but uh, all of us can get a time to Well, we do have a small community. So this paper actually got something like 70 or 80 citations without a 
Third idea also that has to do with graphs is uh, some idea just from that on years ago in a very, very highly cited paper, in fact, almost cited paper that uh, the people cited because of Congress of Mets, the second part to that paper that maybe it's a little red. Yeah, I think it's a very second part. It's you know, basically the idea, I mean, there's a couple of ideas there, but it's the idea that it's the objects that they do to be the do not need to be things like that, but it's to be more complex structured objects like that. And uh, I think this, again, an idea that people can do. If, if people figure out how to do this, it's what they can do. So, you know, it's interesting. You agree on more and more things. Um, we could call you the the leader of deep learning, um, and I'm curious to know: are there things on which you strongly disagree? Like things that you just do not see eye to eye on? Politics getting in the way. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, well, I think I think we we disagree perhaps. I mean, we don't disagree uh, like on many things, but we have sort of different approaches at times to problems and the way we find them. You know, there's a time that uh, Jeff was completely happy with uh, things that had to do with the emissions. Think about it. He called it the probability police. Yes. 